Even those of us who didn't study biblical or ancient Greek in seminary, and I didn't, I don't know about, about Bill. What about you, John? Do you know any ancient Greek? Yeah, John had ancient Greek. Even if you didn't take the class, you picked up a few key phrases along the way. And I'm going to say that most of you did too. How many of you think you are ancient Greek scholars? Raise your hand. You know some, even as Protestants, if you grew up in the church, you probably sang something called the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Doxology is a Greek word meaning a hymn or an expression of praise to God. Some of you grew up calling Holy Communion the Last Supper, while some of you knew this sacred meal as the Eucharist, another word which traces its roots to ancient Greek and even its modern equivalent in Greek, epharisto, which means thanksgiving. But the Greek word that's come to have the deepest meaning for me is one probably not as familiar to Protestants and even some Catholics because it's better known in the Orthodox Church. Even though it's been used by Christ's disciples since the third century and was affirmed in the year 431 by the Council of Ephesus, the word is theotokos. Anybody familiar with that one, Theotokos? The title ascribed to Mary, the mother of our Lord. Theotokos means God-bearer. It's not a term of divinity. It's not a title that speaks to Mary as being equal to God the Father or even to God the Son. Calling Mary the God-bearer is one of the church's oldest claims about her son, who is our Savior. It speaks to the belief that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine exactly what we proclaim when we recite the Apostles' Creed, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, and what we mean when we sing, the child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Many of you know by heart the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? The Word was God. The Word became flesh on that night in Bethlehem, and Mary wrapped the Word in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger. Theotokos, God-bearer, it's kind of an imposing title for a young girl, a Jewish girl from Galilee, an area looked down upon by most Jews, not to mention the occupying forces of the Roman Empire. An average girl from a working class family engaged to an ordinary tradesman. Mary was most likely no older than a high school freshman in today's world in a culture where women had little to no value. Do we have any high school freshmen here today? Stand up for me, please. <laughs> the girls, stand up. Well, I'm thinking Joelle is probably more, Joelle, turn around and look at the congregation. This is the age that Mary was when the angel came to her. You can sit down now. Thank you for that. But yet God saw something in Mary. God saw a faith and a devotion, a heart that was willing to act on the incredible premise, which was the incomprehensible promise that nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. That was the angel's only explanation. Angels in scripture are famous for showing up out of nowhere with the opening line, do not be afraid. And what follows is always, without exception, something that is the craziest, scariest message you will ever hear. Do not be afraid, Mary. When your parents send you away to the country for months, perhaps to keep your condition from being known around the town of Nazareth, do not be afraid when your husband-to-be, who is a man you barely know, will lead you in your ninth month on a 90-mile foot trip, grueling 90 miles to register for the census or when you go into labor without your mother or your sister or anyone you've ever known to help you out. Do not be afraid when no one will take you in and you're forced to give birth, surrounded by the stench of animals, and place your newborn child in a cow's feeding trough. Do not be afraid when you're so poor, so poor that you can only offer a pair of doves when you present your son, God's son, in the temple, or when Simeon, whose name ironically means God receiver, a righteous man who is filled with the Holy Spirit, recognizes in your baby when you take him to the temple that this is God's own son, God's promised salvation. 
And then what does he do? But he turns to Mary and says to her in a prophecy, a sword will pierce your soul. Do not be afraid. And what was Mary's response? Here I am, the servant of the Lord. May it happen to me according to your word. Theotokos is no job for the faint of heart. God-bearing is not, as they say, for sissies. When I was in the seventh grade at Cockeysville, then junior high, now middle school, I was in Baltimore County's experimental seventh grade. I'm not gonna explain much of that to you. It just meant we took part in a course called Humanities, which basically translated, we got to have a field trip every week of the year. On one of these expeditions, we walked, because they hadn't invented buses yet, we walked to Delaney Memorial Gardens to view the statue that I passed by dozens of times when I visited the cemetery with my family. It's a replica of Michelangelo's Pietà from St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Some of you may have seen the original. It's the image of Mary cradling her son on her lap, but not in the stable in Bethlehem, but after his body was taken from the cross. Remember what Simeon said to her, a sword will pierce your soul. As many times as I've looked at that statue, it was the first time that I would ever really see it. What's wrong with it, the art teacher asked us. We were 12-year-olds, not much younger than Mary, when the angel spoke to her. What is wrong with it? We had no answer looking at the statue. The scale is off, he explained to us. Mary is grossly out of proportion because he had to make her larger than life to be able to hold a full-sized man on her lap. No ordinary woman could do that. No ordinary woman. The verb to bear has other meanings beyond giving birth. To bear can mean to hold or support, whether by physical or mental force, to accept something painful with determination and strength, as in to bear up under pressure. To bear can also mean taking on as one's own the debt of another, as in to bear the cost of the repair. Or it can simply mean to carry or take something, as in to bear a gift. In the fuller sense of the word, then, aren't we as Jesus' disciples called to be God-bearers? Aren't we called to hold on to hope in the world and to shoulder each other's burdens Aren't we called and empowered to carry the good news, especially to those for whom forgiveness, salvation, peace, comfort, transformation, or even hope seem incredible and incomprehensible? There is nothing wrong with lights or tinsel or eggnogs or fruitcake. There's nothing wrong even with enjoying a Hallmark movie. Some of you enjoy Hallmark movies. You've told me that already. I love Hallmark movies. They always have a happy ending, and everybody is really, really, really good looking in a Hallmark movie. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with all that. And if you enjoy it, God bless you. But it has very little to do with the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us full of grace and truth. It has little to do with a savior who was willing to bear our sin out of love and the desire to bring us home to God. The one who came to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, the one who came to bind up the brokenhearted, the one who died and was raised from the dead to show the world that nothing will be impossible with God. That is the message I bear in the world living out my call as a pastor. Nothing will be impossible with God. This is the message I bear to the world as a grieving widow. Nothing will be impossible with God. This is the message that I bear to those who, who struggle with addiction. Nothing will be impossible with God. This is the message I bear to those who think they can't forgive the ones who broke their hearts and did them wrong. Nothing will be impossible with God. This is the message that I bear to those who say that they are so set in their bigoted or prejudiced ways and just too old to change. Nothing will be impossible with God. This is the message I bear to those who say that peace between nations or even within a family is a Pollyanna's pipe dream. Nothing will be impossible with God. This is the message that I need you to bear to me. 
when I feel overwhelmed or discouraged, nothing will be impossible with God. Say it with me. Nothing will be impossible with God. Turn to your neighbor and say it. Nothing will be impossible with God. Turn to another neighbor and say it. Nothing will be impossible with God. Now close your eyes and whisper to yourself, nothing will be impossible with God. Welcome to the life of a God-bearer. Mr. Holbein, who was my seventh grade art teacher, had it wrong. Mary was an ordinary woman, but she was an ordinary woman who opened her heart to the extraordinary possibilities of her God. Her faith, like ours, is not a guarantee or a promise that trouble will never touch us. Oh, that it were. But it is the unshakable promise that brokenness, sickness, heartache, despair, and even death itself does not have the last word for us. Advent is the season when the church reclaims Christ's promise that he will come again to establish righteousness and shalom throughout the earth. May God grant each of us faith as simple and sure as Mary's that we may become God-bearers in a world hungry for the hope that Christ brings to us. But if you feel that you're not quite there yet to be a God-bearer, may you, like Simeon, be a God-receiver. May you recognize in Jesus' birth the coming of your Savior. And may God whisper to each of us in our moments of deepest need, do not fear, so that we might find that Courage to answer like Mary, here I am, the servant of the Lord. May it happen to me according to your word, because nothing will be impossible for God.